Hey everybody, Russ Barkley with your weekly update on ADHD research. As always, we start this update with a dad joke, usually a bad one. Uh, in this case, here's your joke. Why do elevator jokes work so well? Because they work on many levels. I know, that's really bad. That's really bad. Here's another one for you though. I'll make maybe it'll make up for the last one. So I went out looking for camouflage pants but I couldn't find any. Makes perfect sense to me. All right, everybody, let's get into the research. Uh, to open up, we're gonna talk about not really a research article, but I discovered this in my newsfeed, and I thought I'd pass it along to you. It's a really nice article on is ADHD a disability and a comprehensive guide to your rights and resources. Essentially talks about how ADHD qualifies as a disability in some cases, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it can allow you to access accommodations in work, in schools such as college and elsewhere uh, for your ADHD if it is of such a severity that it impacts your functioning in those areas. So uh, as always, I've given you the link over in the thumbnail sketch and you can go have a look at the article yourself. But I thought it was a really good description of what you need to know about this issue of ADHD being a disability. Okay, let's get into our research for the week. We're gonna open up with a, a very important study, I think, on the brain structure of people with ADHD as compared to people with autism spectrum disorder and those with both disorders. This happens to be a research article that is out of China uh, and was published in the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal. And they took different groups of children, those with autism spectrum alone, those with ADHD alone, those with both disorders and compared them to a large sample, about 211 typically developing children. And they looked at the gray matter asymmetries in the brain with these different groups and compared the groups to each other. Uh, and so what they're looking at here is how does the gray matter, which is the surface area of the brain, the cortex, how does it differ in these groups? And especially, we know that there are asymmetries in gray matter, for instance, the right frontal lobe and the left frontal lobe are not exactly identical. The same is true with the posterior portion of the brain in terms of their size. So uh, what did they find? They found that those with both ADHD and ASD had certain gray matter changes that were specific to that disorder and not necessarily shared with the other groups with those with pure disorder. Now they did find some areas of poor development in gray matter that were shared across the disorders, which helps us to understand that we know that ADHD and that autism spectrum do overlap to some extent. And it looks like so does some of their brain architecture. But the paper goes on to point out that there were also some things that were quite unique about the comorbid group. And they're arguing that rather than ADHD with autism sort of being additive, you take the findings from one and you add them to the other and that explains the results of the study. They're saying, wait a second, no, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a completely unique pattern of brain architecture in people with the comorbidity, suggesting that they have an entirely different neuroanatomical pathology than do cases that have just one or the other disorder. So very important finding there from our colleagues out of China. Thanks so much. Let's take a look at a paper. This one is out of Mexico. It's also a study of brain activity, not brain architecture in children with ADHD. This one published in the Journal of Attention Disorders. Uh, and this study looks at what is called bold activation. So when you do functional MRIs and when you do other studies such as PET studies, what you're looking at is blood flow in the brain and how that blood flow may differ across groups because the blood flow is kind of an index of brain activation and brain inhibition, particularly during the performance of certain tasks that the individual is doing while they're in the scanner. In this case, they were doing a continuous performance test and they were looking at the functional resonance of the bold signal 
in the groups of children, that is ADHD children and typically developing children. And what they found is that typically developing children show increased inhibition both in their visual parts of their brain and also in their frontal parts of the brain, the frontal executive and motor regions of the brain. And this was not seen as much in the group that had ADHD, suggesting that there were significant problems with inhibiting brain activity as required during this task. They also found that there was overactivation in certain parts of the motor regions in those with ADHD, consistent with, of course, hyperactivity being a characteristic of children with ADHD. So rather consistent there with our thoughts about what is the nature of ADHD. So overall suggesting that these problems with brain activation and inhibition are quite specific to ADHD, not seen in typically developing children. They also found that activation of the cerebellum appeared to be different in people with ADHD, as if they were trying to use a different route of performing this task, that is, at different pathways in the brain, than are being used by typically developing children. So um, a nice study there I thought that you might want to hear more about. I don't usually cover a lot here on neuroanatomy and neuroactivation. Uh, in these research findings, many people find them boring, but I thought it's just another way of highlighting the fact that there are these brain differences between people with ADHD and typically developing children, and <clears throat> that it underlies our view that ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Okay, moving right along, we're going to take, at a, take a look at an article that was published in Research on Toddler and Adolescent Psychopathology, uh, published out of uh, Florida State University. Uh, and in the lab of my friend Michael Koffler and his students and colleagues. This study is looking at a very interesting question, and that is this. We know that ADHD individuals have deficits in executive functioning. I've talked about that many times on this channel. It's also been found in a few studies that if they also have anxiety, it may alter the pattern of findings that we see. It may reduce their inhibition, and it may weaken the findings for working memory. Um, so this article is looking at, is that true? Uh, and it's a very good study. It's a large study using 142 children with ADHD, uh, excuse me, 197 children with ADHD and 142 typically developing children. Um, and this is what they found. Uh, they found that ADHD, regardless of its association with anxiety, was linked to a significant deficit in measures of inhibition. No surprise. The surprising thing was that the presence of anxiety didn't alter that. The deficits that they found were the same, even controlling for anxiety. So that suggests that maybe anxiety doesn't have the effect we thought it did, of kind of lowering or suppressing problems with impulsivity, at least on the task that they used. Now, they also found that there were substantial problems with working memory in the ADHD group, and that these problems were even greater than the degree of problems that were seen with inhibition. And they found that not only did anxiety, when it was present, not worsen measures of working memory, it actually was associated with better performance on working memory tasks than is ADHD. So uh, what this suggests is that the executive deficits seen in people with ADHD are not the result of anxiety, and that anxiety doesn't necessarily have a positive or protective effect when it comes to lowering impulsivity. But it may be associated with some improvement in working memory. Nonetheless, the working memory deficits were still substantial in the kids with ADHD, even controlling for anxiety. So uh, an important finding there, particularly for clinicians who wonder how much anxiety is interfering 
with their ability to interpret neuropsychological testing in people with ADHD. Uh, our next article uh, is also going to be about ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, and this is about sleep problems in people with these disorders. This study comes out of Spain, uh, Valencia, Spain, beautiful place, by the way, if you've never been there. Uh, and it is a comparison of 47 children with ASD, 43 children with ADHD, and a group of 32 typically developing children. All of them matched on age and other variables. And it's looking at various sleep problems in these groups. As you know from my earlier posts, ADHD is associated with significant problems with sleep. About 40% or more of children and adults with ADHD have sleep difficulties. This study finds that the sleeping difficulties were much more specific to the ADHD group than the ASD group. That's important because some people could argue, well, the ASD group has just as many sleeping difficulties, and that's why people with ADHD also may have sleep difficulties. Maybe they have some comorbidity with autism. Nevertheless, what the study shows is that the ADHD group had significantly greater problems with sleep. Up to a third or more of them had such problems, and that their difficulties were associated primarily with sleep breathing, that is, your respiration during sleep, and also excessive sweating during sleep, what they call hyperhidrosis. And that this was found in comparison to the kids with ASD and the typically developing kids, meaning that it was quite specific to the ADHD kids. They also found in their results that these sleeping difficulties help to mediate the relationship of ADHD and ASD to problems with communication in daily life. So that sleeping problems may somehow be disrupting brain functioning, particularly daytime communication activities in both groups of individuals. So they're talking about you really do need to screen for sleeping problems in these populations and try to intervene with them where you can in, because not only will it help their sleeping, but it may help them with their areas of communication during the daytime. We also know that it would help them with their daytime problems with inattention as well. Finally, last up is going to be a study that comes out of Turkey. And this is a study of adults with ADHD and typical adults, and it's looking at the rate of suicidal thinking, known as ideation, suicide attempts, as well as self-mutilation, efforts at self-harm, such as self-cutting and so on, uh, and impulsivity as part of their interviews that they did with these typical adults and these ADHD adults. Now, interesting, they also looked at levels of vitamin B12 and folic acid levels in these two groups. Uh, just as an aside, they didn't find any differences and they didn't find that problems in the levels of vitamins and folic acid were related to either ADHD or to suicide or suicidal thinking. Uh, in these adults. So that's just sort of a, a minor finding here that they were testing. But what they did find is that the adults with ADHD, 40 of them, in comparison to 40 healthy adults, did have increased rates of suicidal behavior, that is gestures, increased rates of suicidal thinking, increased rates of self-mutilation, and higher rates of impulsivity, of course. And they found that the impulsivity partly mediated the relationship of ADHD to these other outcomes. So what's interesting about this is not only is it coming from Turkey, another international study that I like to highlight, but that it replicates a number of studies that have been done in the West, particularly here in the US, showing this increased rate of suicidality and self-mutilation in people with ADHD, typically starting during the high school years, by the way, and into the young adult years, uh, and also 
even higher in women with ADHD than in men with ADHD, though both show elevations in these areas of problems, all of which comes back to the point that I've repeatedly made on this channel, and that is ADHD is a significant public health problem. It's associated with a variety of risks for not only health but, and wellness, but also for life expectancy and survival. Uh, and as you've heard me say before, ADHD does increase one's risk for earlier demise if it is not treated, and usually that is through increasing the risk for accidents and for suicide attempts. Okay, so that's it for this week. All the other research is over in the thumbnail sketch. Hope you'll join me next week for another research review. Thanks for watching this channel, everybody. I really appreciate it, especially those of you who opt to subscribe to the channel. A big thank you to you as well, and we'll catch you next time for another video on the channel. Thank you, and be well.